Oh, okay. Sorry, Scott. Um, oh, no, no, no. My name is Liz Harris, um, and uh, and I translate exclusively uh, fiction. Um, so that's a you know I feel um, uh, lucky to be up here with all these editors, and almost all of them I've actually published something with. And so I so I ask them to um, uh, to come and, and talk. Oh, it's much brighter. That's so much better. Um, the um, to my to my left um, is Ellen okay, Elias. First, Borsak. Did I do it? Yes. Okay. Um, with Asymptote. And um, Jim Hicks is with Massachusetts Review. Um, Susan Harris is with Words Without Borders. Minna Proctor is with the Literary Review. And Scott Esposito is um, with uh, Two Lines. Um, and they're going to be uh, introducing uh, the various journals and, um, and what, they're, what they're looking for in fiction. They'll, they'll talk briefly and then we'll open it up um, to questions. I, I just thought maybe I'd you know, introduce, it. I mean, for me, it was really a godsend to have uh, the journals to start uh, beginning to, to publish at presses. Um, so I, you know, I worked pretty, I was a fiction writer before um, translating, and I used to actually um, shoot for publishing my, um, my translations with the journals that I knew to be um, you know, the places that, that I wanted to get my fiction published, um, and I initially <coughs> Uh, had thought that getting, you know, I got them in like Kenyon Review and Missouri Review, and you know, I was really happy with those publications, but I, I've come to realize that the places that are really the, probably the most important for international literature, the, the ones that really focus on international literature, that everybody is, is linked in um, with one another. Um, so why don't we go ahead and, and uh, you know, just go along and you all can introduce yourselves in the, in the journal and anything else you want to say, and then we'll open it up. And speak loudly. We'll start, we'll start with Ellen and just move down. Okay, I, I work as a contributing editor with Asymptote. I checked against the list of people who are here at the conference, and I could see at least 12 people who've either contributed or are working as one sort of an editor or another at the, at the journal. As a contributing editor, I'm not a commissions editor. I don't actually, there are categories like criticism, poetry, fiction, and so forth, and each one of those has a dedicated editor who uh, chooses things. But but uh, I have had now a year of a ha and a half of experience there, and I think quite a few of you know quite a lot about it. Is there anybody here who's either published with Asymptote or, or have worked with them in one way or another? Okay, so quite a few. Uh, it, that was my impression. That's a pretty large number. What, there are several things that are interesting about it. They're just entering their fifth year of we, or we are entering our fifth year with work from 95 countries, 67 languages with 75 volunteers from 27 countries and 16 guest artists. So the art is very important. And they, uh, I spoke with Yu Leong, who is the person who started the journal and, and sort of has given it its, its profile. And he had the following just to say about, about what, how he curates, because he feels very strongly about curating each issue. And he feels that the individual texts are, are interesting in and of themselves, but he also is really interested in the ways they work together. So that's something that he's working towards. And he says, I curate for diversity and try to pick pieces that speak to each other and resonate thematically. And I try to look beyond Europe. I find we get a lot of submissions from French, Italian, Spanish. So if we just relied on those, our world literature journal would really be a European literature journal. So I impose a quota of sorts on my section editors. They have to get content from outside Europe. And they made a really concerted effort to bring in all sorts of world languages. Uh, and if you want an interesting key, if you're thinking about publishing with Asymptote, go to the website and go to the map feature. And you have lots of filters, so you can just <coughs> see where poetry is being, what country's poetry has come from, what country's fiction has come from, and so forth. And you can get a nice idea of the range. I noticed, for example, that there is no fiction in the regular fiction section from Russia. So anyway, there, once you see that, you can begin to, to gauge some things and uh, take a look at what they have and, and think about it. It's, it's a great journal. They generally do current writing, but sometimes they do really old pieces, sometimes ancient pieces. So there's a kind of a range, but always um, up to 5,000 words and, and sort of edgy, you know, sort of lively and, and uh, engaging would be, you know, all of you will take that as you do, but um, anyway, so that's, that's and, and if you're interested in submitting, look at the submissions page. Oh, and just a quick word, they have special features. Uh, <clears throat> there are two special features 
uh, in each issue. For example, one is coming up on the Vietnam War and its legacy 50 years on for April 2015. <coughs> and they are inviting both translated and original English work for that. And they are just about to come out in January. We are with, with a Danish fiction issue, but the deadline for that just <coughs> And they have an, and we have an interesting, um, they, we, uh, an interesting feature called Writers on Writers, where uh, it's written in English, passionately, fewer than 2,500 words about a relatively unknown writer writing in a language other than English. So that's another thing that translators might consider uh, contributing. Okay. I'm taking notes too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I'm Jim Hicks, and I started editing the Massachusetts Review about five and a half years ago now. Um, and when I did, I basically had two goals. Um, one was to get back some of the uh, political energy that the magazine had when it started in 1959. And uh, the second one was to publish more in translation. And I actually thought that the second was the way of achieving the first. And, uh, and Got a feeling I'm probably preaching to the converted here on, on that score. But um, I mean, if you don't know the magazine, um, I mean, it was always internationalist in scope. I mean, we published that, the first translation of, of Roberto Fernandez Retamar's Caliban essay. We published um, Jean Paul Sartre's um, review of Aimé Césaire. Um, we published, uh, and for a while, this was like the one cash cow we had, um, Chinua Achebe's Conrad um, Image of Africa essay. And uh, so it's always, you know, done that work, but, uh, but, you know, when I was coming in, it was the, you know, the fading years of the Bush regime and deprovincializing uh, this country seemed like a reasonable step that uh, we could maybe take a few, um, you know, at least baby steps in that direction. Um, as I said, <laughs> preaching to the converted, well, there's, it's not the wrong thing to do, of course. I mean, part of the reason for having ALTA and having an annual conference is that, you know, you get to come together, you know, it's a pilgrimage, you know, the things you most deeply value, you see the people who share those values, you know, you're affirmed in your values, you can go out and suffer in the world where people <laughs> do not share necessarily the truth as you know it, but, um, but so that's good. Um, the, I did think though that, I, I, that I'd also say at least one thing about what we're looking for in terms of fiction as well, um, and maybe this might be a little more challenging because, um, and I'm not sure I entirely believe it myself, but, uh, but uh, because like you, I, mean, I do some translating and, and a lot of it comes from you know falling in love usually with the work and the author that uh, that you're working on, but uh, but I also wonder whether, especially because what we're most interested in is the political potential of translation, whether author-centered is really what we're most after, um, and I think at some level it isn't necessarily that or only that. That it's it's perhaps you know translation as as a as a performative intervention into what's being thought and said, particularly in the context of you know the the discourse in this country. Um, and uh, I'm really to some extent I'm just rephrasing something that I heard Amiel Elkali say uh, when he was a keynote speaker at. Uh, <coughs> a conference organized by our graduate students who are always way ahead of us at, at the University of Massachusetts. Um, and he was basically saying that. He said, look, translation can be a political action. And there are times when it has to be. And I'm not sure there are other times. So anyway, thanks. Um, I'm Susan Harris with Words Without Borders. And one thing about Alta every year in, and looking out in this room, um, my prof I've been with uh, Words Without Borders for 11 years and uh, since the beginning and was in, trans in book publishing for 16 years before that. And um, my, prof my professional life is passing before my eyes <laughs> because I've worked with so many people in, in the room and, and on the panel. But um, words, we, pu we publish monthly. We're an online magazine of literature and translation. Uh, 
We publish only lit in translation and we publish only first English translations. Um, every issue has a theme, either a language, a country or a geographical region, or a topic. Um, every year we do a graphic novel issue, every year uh, one of my colleagues uh, manages a queer issue, and we also do every year a, an issue of the guest of literature from the guest country at the Frankfurt Book Fair, um, which this year was Finland, which was a terrific, mm. uh, terrific uh, issue and a real a new language. I wanted to pick up on Jim's point about translation as a political act because our first three issues presented literature from Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. Uh, which you may remember is, or you might recognize as three of the seven axes of evil, um, used in quotes. And one of the reasons that we wanted to start out that way is that there are so many parts of the world that, particularly in the U.S., we know only through a political prism. And if all you know about a country and its people is war and government and politics, you're missing a crucial part of culture and humanity. Um, and without sounding naive, it is not that we think that, it's not that, that uh, politics and war should be ignored, but the literature of a country and the everyday life of a country sheds as much, con con sheds, provides as much context on complex and, and culture and beliefs that any kind of nonfiction reporting does. And the other advantage of publishing literature from specific countries is that as opposed to having Western or US writers essentially parachute into an area, do their reporting, file one article, and leave, um, we are getting the inside view. Uh, that was one of the huge, one of the, the uh, I think, huge values in the issue that we did a couple of years ago on the Mexican drug wars. Uh, which was written by people living in Mexico, talking about um, what hell their what what a hell the country had been turned into by the drug cartels. Um, to talk to talk about statistics, um, as I mentioned, we are in our eleven. We just celebrated our eleventh anniversary. We publish monthly, so to date, we've published more than two thousand pieces um, by writers in one hundred and twenty from one hundred and twenty eight countries in one hundred and five languages, and. Now, every issue, again, as I mentioned, had a theme, but we also have features every issue, uh, which are many, many issues in a way, three to four, three to four pieces on a theme, um, usually with an introduction. We also publish book reviews. Uh, we have a blog, Dispatches, which we update um, not quite daily, but that's where we publish a lot of, that's where we publish other critical writing, um, Again, the sort of writing that is perhaps more, more pegged to the news cycle. Um, we have always made a point of providing access to, we, we want to be a source for writers and readers to come to find out about the rest of the world, whatever the rest of the world means for them. And of course, final word, I know I'm uh, really pontificating here, but um, the other advantage, we're online and we're free. So we're accessible to anyone with access to a computer anywhere in the world at any time, anywhere, um, any day. And I think that also is very crucial in this very highly political, I think, um, matter of publishing work in translation and trying to connect cultures. Um, I'm, I'm um, Minna Proctor. I'm from the Literary Review. Um, and I'm just very grateful that you pontificated because I seem to have gotten sick sometime between oh, last so night. Sorry. Milwaukee made me sick. <laughs> and so um, I don't know if I'm contagious, but I'm really stupid. <laughs> <laughs> so I have, I have all these, my brain is not entirely functioning. So I'm going to formulate some sentences <laughs> and know that I have more to say and one day I'll say it better. Um, and I'll do my best. Um, so the Literary Review is a, um, is a quarterly magazine. We've been publishing since 1957. I've got two years on you. And, um, and I've been there for six, six years, so I'm winning in this competition. <laughs> <laughs> Just a little bit. Um, we, ha we were started with a, with a global mandate um, which is a 
word my university uses. I'm not sure what they mean by it, but we mean we like to publish literature from all over the world just with the idea that literature doesn't have borders um, and that the whole point of literature is to open minds and um, explore other worlds and that could be the head of a sick person or the head of someone from North Korea. Um, and so what, um, what we have done historic, we've handled our international mandate in a number of different ways over the, over the years we've been publishing. Before I came on, there was a long period in which we would do um, regional issues where we would publish Danish literature um, or um, you know, uh, French literature, and that would be, a whole issue would be dedicated to that language. We did away with that because I actually thought it was more kind of expansive in our context to have um, interesting literature right. that didn't have any kind of restrictions on it. And I didn't like the idea um, that the way we were doing it in our magazine, it kind of almost ghettoized. It was like, the translation will be in this issue. Mm -hmm. you know, so what we decided to do was bring in translation to every issue. Um, one of the reasons I came to Alta and like to come to Alta um, is because we actually don't get as many submissions from translators as we would love to get. So I'm kind of coming to pitch you guys. Um, it's, it's a very interesting thing. Um, I'm a translator myself, and I think from the very beginning, um, my thought was that when you grew up to be a translator, you would, have a, you would publish this book. Um, and it didn't occur to me until after I had sort of sold the book that you could then take pieces of the book and send them to magazines. But I could have started the other way around and sent to the magazines. And um, since I was working on short stories, also if you're working on poems. Um, and so as, a, as a, having been in that situation, I think translators don't always think of journals as a place to bring their work. Um, it's a wonderful place to publish, especially if you're working um, on a little bit of something, or if you're in progress on a book and just want it to get exposure, or if your book's about to come out, it's a way um, to <coughs> reach more people. Even once you publish your translation book, sometimes it's with small presses, and um, we just it's just a little bit of expanding of the audience through literary magazines is a wonderful way to just hit more readers, since that's the mission, just get to more people. Um, so. We, uh, we publish translation in, uh, we publish poetry and fiction in translation. We do look for short form, meaning um, we, we don't take excerpts. It's very hard for us to take excerpts of novels um, but, or longer works, but we do do essays and short stories, maybe work that's sort of organized in vignettes or very episodic, might, that's very excerptable, might work. Um, in terms of what we look for in fiction, the, um, the, the easiest thing to say, which all editors, I think, of magazines say is, read the magazine and see what we like. Um, so <laughs> we are available online. We have, we have featured work. It's not the entire issue, but a great deal of it is available online. Um, and so you can get a sense of what we do like. It's hard to describe since it's based on taste, usually mine. Um, <laughs> which on some days might be one way and on other mornings might be another way. Um, but we do tend to like work that is, um, this, is an ex this is an expression that I've kind of come to rely on, work that really has the courage of its convictions. I don't, ha you know, I don't really have anything more than that. I don't like very self-conscious work. Mm -hmm. I don't like overly labored work. Um, it's interesting when you apply those terms to certain continental literature, I think, where overly worked is a form of, as a, reaches a higher form of art than it might in English, um, original language work. But um, so we like kind of aggressive, strong, forceful um, fiction generally. And you can get a sense of what I mean by that because that's a little abstract. So it may not mean anything concrete. I'm going to stop there. I'm not sure if that actually made sense. But you can, you can <laughs> ask me questions about that. Right. Hi, my name is Scott Esposito. I come from Two Lines, that is published by Two Lines Press, which is a program of the Center for the Art of Translation. Uh, we're based in San Francisco, and we promote translation with event series, with um, in-school education, and with the press that we do, Two Lines Press. 
So two lines has been around for 20 years. It was founded in 1994. It started out as an annual. Now we do it twice a year. Uh, we tend to publish in the fall and the spring. <coughs> we have year-round submissions, so you can just do that easily online at twolinespress.com. You get all the information right there. Uh, what else can I tell you? We do we do fiction, poetry, and we also do essays. Um, these can be this can be kind of a mixture. We do just kind of like essays that are around not not necessarily translation theory, but kind of more like the practice of translation or trying to um, put things into like new frameworks. Like in issue twenty one, we did an essay by Johannes Gorenson, who was kind of laying out his ideas about what translation is. So we do stuff like that. We also do stuff that might interact with, um, with the translation in the issue. Like in issue 22, we're gonna have something where it's kind of the translator talking about her relationship to a translation that she's also publishing the issue. So we do those essays, um, we do interviews, but it's, it's mostly fiction and poetry. Um, insofar as that all goes, I would say, you know, I think I would echo a lot of the things that I've heard here. We go for um, linguistic and geographic diversity, definitely. Um, we're most interested in, you know, living authors who are doing work. You know, if, if there's someone who's like a discovery, we'll definitely be interested in that. We're not really so interested in uh, translations of classics or, you know, retranslations of classic authors. Those are, I mean, it's, it's a possibility, but those are going to be a little bit lower on the priority scale. Um, I think our aesthetic is mostly, you know, we just, we're very interested in very kind of innovative, forward-looking prose. A lot of the poetry submissions in particular that we get, you know, they're really kind of conceptual and interesting, and I think that can be really good. Like, I think um, in issue 22 or 23, they'll be coming out next year, like we have something from the Olipo, which is kind of a cool translation. Um, yeah, I mean, but also, like, it doesn't have to be overly conceptual. We definitely want stuff that kind of hits you in the gut and has, you know, a real connection. Uh, at, at the moment, we're, we're doing really well on poetry. So I would say if you have really strong fiction or really strong prose, um, <coughs> you'd want to send that our way. I mean, not, not to say don't send your poetry, but at the moment, that's kind of where our needs lie. Mm -hmm. uh, what else can I say? It's by label. It's, it's bilingual. The poetry is bilingual. On the prose, we do the first page is bilingual, and then after that. Yeah. Um, oh, and I think, yeah, just, you know, maybe one thing I would stress when you're submitting your fiction or, or your poetry, you know, really, really revise, 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 you know, give that thing 10, 20 looks from start to finish. I think one of the things that gets on my nerves a lot and that I think you know nobody has a whole lot of patience for is just stuff you know, that really feels like it's just a little muddy and it could be a little bit tighter. You know, that's, for me at least, something that really distinguishes kind of the ones that are nice from the ones that are really like, wow, this is, this is really top notch. So I mean, I would definitely encourage that. Um, if, if I may, just before, before opening it up, um, just to, to say something that, I mean, you all wouldn't say this about yourselves, so I'm, I'm going to say it is, um, uh, is how supportive it is to have, you know, these, um, these editors publishing your work, that it isn't just, um, it isn't just the author's work, it, they support the translators, and, and uh, it's amazing how, how, I mean, Minna was, did one of the very first you know things that I ever translated, and I and I wound up with the the book as a result of what she introduced me to. And it wasn't just that she kept on suggesting m my name for other things. Thank you. It was so. <laughs> Susan has been you know a constant support, and and Jim, I'll, I'll say, um, did something that was absolutely lovely, um, which is that he put the uh, the sto uh, the story that was uh, accepted uh, by uh, Julia Mozzi. Mozi's name was put on the cover of the journal, and so was mine. <laughs> and, and I can't tell you what that meant. And also because I told him the sort of humble, you know, th thank you. Of course, I know I'm just along for the ride. And I got a lecture from him in the email. No, you're not. You know, and it was so supportive. So you know, you really pursuing it is it really matters a lot. Um, let's go ahead and, and, and open this up. Yeah, the, the side there. Thank you for this panel. 
Uh, my name is Faisal Sultan, and I am the founder of Darsafi, where we uh, translate books from Arabic meaning the region into English, and we have uh, 11 books ready this year. Uh, what struck me about what Jane said about uh, uh, poetry or literature as a political statement is when I was standing uh, close to my uh, table there with the books and somebody approached and uh, looked at one of the books which happened to be my poetry collection called Let's Give War a Chance. It's an iron <laughs> <laughs> with a picture of, of Bunsville there. Um, and he, he picked the book and he looked at me and said, no, I don't believe that poetry should be involved in politics. That's for me, it's not poems. And he put it back. And I, I was struck by his statement first. I think he was in the wrong conference because he said politics and translation. <laughs> <laughs> Second, he didn't realize that since I was eight years old in Iraq, being from the Kurdish area, and since the first time I hear the bomb, and the siren that's always there and lives with me even 18 years after I lived in the United States. And I didn't realize how people think that politics should not be involved in literature. For some nations, the first thing you learn is a poem by a poet who starts a revolution, who, say, who, who calls for, for the independence of his country and he's the hero of the whole nation. Uh, my, my, my uncle was executed by Saddam's regime and he was a poet. And when in, on his grave, what we put, which was his poems, calling for the country of Kurdistan. So I don't know how politics cannot be with you. Does anyone have some, some questions in, in relation to um, Fiction specifically, or also um, maybe non-fiction, which we haven't talked about, but was mentioned. Um, Liz, over just a second. I just wanted to say um, this is the cover of the issue that will come out of the Massachusetts Review in December, and it has a special um, Egyptian street art uh, insert, and the cover is a woman holding up a poster of Nefertiti wearing a gas mask, oh, wow. and in Arabic it says, "A woman's voice is a revolution." Exactly. <laughs> Do you want to uh, yeah, my question was about the sort of cover letter. Um, I'm not sure I have some guy talk. So you said a lot about what kind of prose you're looking for. So how important is it that the cover letter um, establish that this person is the most important person writing in their country, the least discovered person writing in their country, the only person in their country who does X, Versus, you know, here's a pretty good writer, and, but then it kind of blends in with everything else. So, what do you want? What do you actually want to know besides what's in front of you? It's interesting. Can per so, can you uh, I mean, personally, I I don't really want to know a whole lot more than just reading the text itself. I mean, it's it's nice to have that, and I might like refer back to that. Um, but but really, I just I'm looking for something that grabs me that I feel like is really using language in a very interesting way. And that, that I feel like is just a very beautiful and, you know, um, good translation. And, you know, and with, with Google and such these days, I feel like if you, if you want that information, if that's like an important criterion, you can get that. Yeah, like, like it, it maybe, maybe at some point in the editorial meeting, it might come down to like that would be a relevant factor, but I think that would be like a much lower consideration than just like, how is this moving me? How is this working? How is this playing off against the rest of the stuff in the issue? Those sorts of questions. Anybody disagree with that? Um, I, I want to say uh, actually two things about it. I mean, generally speaking, um, because our project is, you know, sort of pro-literature, um, we don't have, and we don't have like an anthropological position. It actually doesn't matter to, I mean, we're not doing that kind of work, right? And so it doesn't matter really, as Scott said, how important somebody is. Um, it, and it, we really are judging on the merit of the work that, and a lot of times in, in uh, at least when the work comes to me to read, I don't look at the cover letter. I might see a tag that says it's in translation, but I'm going to go right to the text before I look at the cover letter, which isn't to say that the cover letter shouldn't include a little bit of information that's helpful for us for context, for the um, 
for the maybe the readers who are reading before me. Um, and I don't know if we can um, talk about this now or later, but we, in our submission guidelines, we ask for the translators to tell us that they have the right to be sending this out. And I know that's kind of a, I think that's a controversial position um, that we ask for you to, for the translators. I don't know, I've, 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 had, I've had moments where people have said, no, the publisher should be finding the rights. But as a small, as a, with our resources, we do ask for the translator to say, I have the author's permission or the estate's permission to be sending this out for publication so that we won't run into, um, tr if we accept it, then we won't find we're not able to publish it for a technicality. So that, that's important to see in the cover letter. Um, any, any other comments on the cover letter? I, I'd sort of disagree that, that, that the work, it's just because I don't really trust that anything stands on its own that all discourse takes place within some kind of frame. Um, but I don't also have set policies, either for cover letters or for you know, kind of you know, explanatory footnotes or anything else. But it made me think of your story. Again, the, the title of the story is F. But what it tells is the story of a judge from his point of view the day he's assassinated. And anybody in Italy who reads that knows who F is. Right? And you remember we went back and forth on yeah. this a little bit. It's like, what should we do? Should we name him in the title? And you can't change the title of it. And so what we ended up doing was, was, um, was putting a quote from him as an epigraph. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And yeah, that's really good. And, 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 and collection. Wow. Yeah, as, and I was going to say that Liz must have liked it because I noticed it <laughs> in the published version. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, I can't remember exactly what it was. It, um, it, it well, it's basically they were going to kill me soon. Yeah, or yeah. Later. It doesn't. It doesn't matter. Yeah. They're going to. It doesn't matter. The mafia's going to kill me anyway, or something. Yeah. Like whenever, that. whenever they want to look. look yeah. Through, yeah. Yeah. And they did. Um, know, and that's a really interesting point because. In, in, and not talking about cover letters, but there's always the question of how much you need to tell your readership for something to make sense. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a, I think probably for all of us, that's mm -hmm. a constant editorial uh, concern or cons consideration, mm -hmm. I think. Um, that, does the cover letter, in some ways, I mean, you're, you're, um, you're also dealing with the possibility that, um, that someone's not not they could be a decent writer but not necessarily a very effective translator you know like they might not know the original language very well is there any uh, any way that um that that's considered do you want um you know original language submitted with the with the work um how how does that work for you i can speak to that at asymptote actually they publish the original text uh, on the side on a margin you can click on it and get it and a recorded version if they can get it of the original text and then there's a translator's note but all of this is sort of under a link so it's except for the bios on the side you don't see any of that unless you click on it and mm -hmm. open it up but you can both hear the text read it in the original and then the translator's note which can explain some of the contextual yeah. things Susan was raising. Yeah. 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 And we publish wherever possible we publish everything in the original language as well and we have a wonderful uh, feature on our site where you can read only the English, only the original by clicking only the only the translation, only the original text or side by side mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is quite wonderful. Um, I think it's also quite crucial particularly for poetry mm -hmm. where interpretation is, is, is so much more perhaps more flexible. Mm -hmm. yeah, we, we ask for both to be submitted the original and, and the translation. Um, we haven't gotten into publishing the original at all simply because we Lots. don't want to have to bother with rights in all over the planet but, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we also won't consider you for our translation prize if you don't send the original mm -hmm. along. So Which, um, a little by, incentive. By the way, with, um, we talked up here very briefly that um, it seems like sometimes in these uh, round tables that the conversation winds up almost exclusively about obtaining copyright and I, I wonder if we could <laughs> try to limit Please. that so that you know, there's other things to talk about too. Um, is, are there some, some... Should I, I should just address, but we don't actually ask for the original and we um, give you the totally separate, I mean it's just a different kind of agenda, but we um, have to give you the benefit of the doubt. So we assume that um, 
we don't check. We don't have the resources. We so right. we really we really only basing on the on the English. And because of the nature of of our aesthetic, um, we like work that stands on its own. You know, in terms of context. Right. If it so that if it needs a great deal of context, it's harder for us to publish yeah. it. It's and that's just that's just about the aesthetic of the magazine, kind of a minimalist, like here's the work, and that's and that's mm -hmm. all we do. But it also means that um, you could be lying, and we yeah, won't you know. You could publish pseudo yeah. translation without knowing. It. Yeah, yeah, we can, we might do that. But that's, just, our, that's, that's the cool. risk we run. <laughs> I was just wondering if maybe the cover letter yeah, might so. also be a place to establish the translator's credentials. Yeah. Credentials, or does that not, maybe that doesn't matter. It's probably cool. <laughs> <laughs> and I think ultimately a text has to work in English. Yeah. And that's where I think all of us are going. Some other questions out here? Yeah. I was going to ask, I'm sorry, but I was going to ask about permissions. So if you could just briefly talk a little bit more about that. <laughs> Yeah, v very briefly. I'm going to like put my little fist down. <laughs> um, I can tell you what we do. We, we don't ask the translators secure rights because in many cases publishers will not work with an individual. They will only work with an organization. We do ask that anyone who is submitting something to us ascertains that the rights are available. We're somewhat unusual in that we buy rights, from, we buy um, English language rights even though we're a magazine and not a book publisher, we buy the rights from the original publisher or, or author. And we have contracts with both publisher, we, we have contracts with both the publisher or author and the translator. But we, we are very careful about that. We would never publish anything intentionally without the proper permissions in hand. Yeah, basically the same with us, that um, we, you know, we ask you to get the rights if you can, make sure the rights are available. Um, in the end, the publisher is legally responsible, so yes. yeah, we, we understand that too. And, and as for paying for rights, we've done it. Um, we don't have the money to do it, so yeah, it makes it tougher. Yeah. Asymptote just says, they let us know that you've worked out the question of the rights. So they put it all on the translator. I don't think that as far as I know, they don't. Uh, um, maybe somebody working with Asymptote here might know more about that, but as far as I'm sh uh, informed, at least for me, when I submitted work to them, that was what they asked me to. Can, can uh, people hear um, Ellen? Sorry, I'm just, <clears throat> yeah. Sorry, I don't want to torture Excuse you. Excuse me. It, it's, a, it, oh, it, it's a publisher who sold rights to Asymptote, who just found out Asymptote public. No, I'm teasing. <laughs> 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 Sorry about that, everybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I, I apologize. I thought my phone was off. That's so rude. That was good. That was good. Okay, we can move on, right? So, let's move on, shall we? With, um, in the back there. Hi, um, Susan, I wonder if you might share any upcoming themes that you'd be looking for submissions and anyone else who has themes coming up. Right. Um, we plan our issues quite far in advance, and at this point, we are uh, we have our uh, agenda set through December of 2015. Um, and what's coming up is um, entirely, almost entirely language and country driven. Uh, some years just are more so than others. But what we, um, I think what we, uh, we we all we have two annual theme. We always do a graphic novel issue in February. And we always do a queer issue in June. So you can, and those are always drawing from all languages, all countries. Um, otherwise, this year, everything is um, pretty much wrapped up in specific countries and languages. And most of those issues, we are working with guest editors who will make the selection. So we don't have as much um, flexibility in acquiring, but obviously, um, I, I certainly am interested in hearing hearing about uh, possible projects. Yes. Um, do you have a sense of how uh, common it is for publisher book publishers to pick up things that appear in your journals and, and show interest and they even buy the whole book? Because I often tell yeah. authors who approach me, this is a really good way to get your name out there and publishers read this, but I actually have no idea if that's true. <laughs> I'll, I'll go first, but um, we, we actually have a, um, an industry newsletter that we send to publishers and editors, uh, not only in the U.S., but 
abroad um, in which we recommend books that from which we might have published either extracts or um, other work by an author that we do think would be successful in translation, being very careful to consider the market as well as the quality. I know that at this point about 20 books that we've published extracts from um, have, have been picked up for publication. I think it depends a lot on, um, I certainly think that anybody who's publishing translation, any book publisher who's working in translation is reading the, is reading the magazines. Um, and I think I think it is excellent exposure. Yeah, I would just I would agree with that. I mean, for everyone at this table, I think um, these are publications, two lines included, that are being looked at by people in the industry. Uh, I mean, I haven't done a count or anything, but definitely I do take note when I happen to see something that we've originally published that go on to be a book somewhere. And I mean, it does it does happen with some regularity, and I think there is some kind of correlation there. <coughs> you can also use. Um, if the publisher doesn't happen to find you in the journal as a translator, you can use the publication as a, a credential. Yes, and I think definitely. that that kind of pre-screening of being in the literary magazines yeah. makes it much easier to get into the door of most of the presses. I, I, I really think that's true. Yeah. Oh, it makes it easier to get into the door of the other other magazines yeah. too. Yeah. 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 So. yeah, and it's just, at some level, it's just kind of common sense that Magazines can take chances that, that presses, especially small presses, that you know they publish one book that doesn't make its money, you know they could be in trouble. Yeah, right. So so we can take the chances, but then you get the cred for having having placed it. Right. And sometimes I mean we work with the small presses that we see as fellow travelers really closely. I mean, um, you know, say Archipelago sends us something that's coming out. We publish you know a story by Tabuki. Um, and then you know the book comes out after it's good for both of us, but it works the other way too. I mean we published uh, um, an excerpt of a novel by a, a, a Indian author, well Danish Indian author. He lives in in, in Denmark, um, and uh, I liked it so much I I kept talking about it with a friend of mine who runs Interlink uh, Books, and uh, and he took he published his next book. So, I mean, it works that way too. You know, I'll just add, um, actually, a book that we did. It came out in October called Baboon by Danish author Nyamri Eight. Um, we got the idea to do that book because we published one of the stories originally in two lines, and we really liked it, so we asked the translator to see more. So, I mean, I don't want to create expectations that if you publish in two lines, we're going to take your book, but that, that has happened. So. And it's just, it's just a good way to establish a relationship in general. You know, if we, if we like your submissions, if we see you're doing really high quality work, you know, we're going to remember your name. Some other? Yeah. Are any of you interested in publishing creative nonfiction in translation? And if you are, what, what are you interested in? Um, I'm interested in publishing creative nonfiction in translation. Yeah, I, 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 would, I would agree with that. Great. Um, I mean, we, I don't know if it's, if it's going to happen or not, but I know that we were interested in a submission that was kind of creative nonfiction around the concept of translation. So, I mean, there's, there's like that. There's this other piece I mentioned before where it's kind of um, the author, she, she has a, an interesting kind of approach to her work of translation. So I would say it's more like creative nonfiction than a translator's introduction. It's just more kind of voice and narrative driven. So there's stuff like that. Um, there's also just like, you know, if you have a really great piece of translated like travel literature or translated nonfiction. Actually, there's, there's a piece we're going to be doing on the online portion of the journal. But yeah, it's, it's, um, it's nonfiction writing about just kind of this um, autobiography set in the Balkans, and it's really cool. So, so yes, yeah, so we definitely would look at that stuff seriously. Uh, Asymptote also has published creative nonfiction, and I'm sure they'd be in, in translation, they'd be interested. And I'm very, I'm very partial to uh, literary reportage, uh, particularly Polish, um, but, uh, uh, <laughs> but, but I've, I've done features and, and issues on that. So yes, and we, we, we are open to including it in our issues where appropriate. Yeah, for us, um, I'd actually even say more so because nonfiction in general is uh, is what we have to work the hardest to get what we want. Um, 
mm-hmm. and uh, and we're as interested in translation in, in nonfiction as in fiction or poetry. Mm-hmm. And uh, but but really nonfiction. On the one hand, it's also a way to say maybe more <coughs> more directly what you believe um, in a way that that's immediate and recognizable for your readers. But uh, but again, it's for us. It's it's what we receive the least of. Yeah. That that we're really interested in. I mean, and if you want to know what we're not interested in, it's the the third memoir by a 25 year old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we get that. We yeah. That's what we mostly get. <laughs> some other uh, some other questions. Wow. You see, you shut down the uh, copyright stuff. <laughs> yeah. I have a question. This might be slightly controversial, but I, um, I always think the, the, the slipperiest thing to get right is, is the taste question. And yes. whenever I speak to editors about, like, what are you interested in, they always say, oh, read the magazine. And I go, I need so much to read. <laughs> and um, I often find it interesting to ask editors to compare their publication to other publications. Uh, as a way of kind of teasing out this question of taste. And I was wondering if the panelists would be interested in sort of, because I'm presuming you all read one another's magazines, and sort of talking a little bit about your publication in relationship to one another's and what differences you see and what commonalities you see. That's good. That's like a modern question. question. Yeah, it's it's a very good question. I just want to start by saying, um, I I can't do that, but... um, <laughs> but um, we had a we have uh, we just published an issue called Glutton's Kitchen, which is our foodie issue. Um, and there's not a lot of food in it, but there is this one story by um, by a wonderful writer named Robert Lopez called um, Big People Everywhere, in which the narrator talks about how much he loves getting massages from fat women. Um, and it w- it's interesting because it's really kind of like very much like a person. The, the way that it's written, it's very much a character piece and, and <coughs> doesn't have a strong plot or anything like that. It's really just this <coughs> voice and this character, and it fit in so beautifully with our foodie theme. Um, and he's such a marvelous writer that we took it. And my um, my managing editor was reading the piece, and she was like, she said to me that. Um, that she was a little baffled by the piece because um, nobody died, and that, and she said, she said it's just that we usually publish things that are so grim that that when when this really strong voice didn't end up murdering his his beloved, you know, it was sort of, it felt like so it was un, you know it was wrong because the nature of our there were he she had so much suspense built up that he was going to kill because I guess we have a lot of murderers, especially the first person fiction in our in our magazine. So I think that that might speak a little bit to my proclivities. You know, we, we actually, we're, we're totally simpatico. Like, 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 there's always a point in the issue where we're like, we just have a lot of really down stuff. Like, yeah. like we need something to lighten this up. Yeah. So just send us your, your lighter stuff. <laughs> um, okay, so just like... Or, like, um, or the murderers in the room. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. you know, the murderer is actually a dog or something. It's cute. Um, but just kind of like, like on the question of reading the magazine, like I totally understand where you're coming from, and like I have piles and piles of books at home. Um, I do feel though, like, like if you are contributing to the publication, it's good to like support it in some way. Yes. I mean, I think subscriptions to two lines are ridiculously cheap. Um, you know, so some of these are free online, so you can like tweet about them, or I'm sure they'll take donations. But I think it is good to like kind of be a good citizen in terms of like, you know, I believe I believe in this place enough to publish my work in it. So you know, maybe I can also believe it enough to read it or just <laughs> spread the word about it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I understand. Like, we're all busy people. I'm not trying to like shame anyone in this room. And I, I myself like publish essays and journals, and then don't read the rest of the journal at all. So I, I understand that. But yeah. There's also, I mean, when you're talking to a room full of like aspiring fiction writers, it's very easy to say, look, you re- you want to you want to send your work to the magazine that you love the work of it, like the magazine that you really love, 
um, it's not it's not even as if you're trying to see your work alongside you know it's like oh I would fit in there because it's hard to predict if you're gonna fit in because my idea of fitting in is gonna be different than your idea of fitting in it's more like I just love the work in here and that becomes that sort of that's your aesthetic you love the work so maybe your aesthetic matches mine um, it's it's interesting when you've got that extra kind of um, like shifting shifting um, filter of the translation you know so you have to think like would my author love the work in here I, I kind of feel like maybe you don't have you have to see I love the work enough to be translating it and so you can behave at that point like you are the aspiring fiction writer do you love the work in this magazine um, my author might love the work in this magazine dead or alive <laughs> Dead author. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so much easier to work yeah. with. <laughs> um, I have a question. Uh, do you all um, mind it when uh, people submit to more than one place, multiple submissions? Is that a problem, or not so long as we're as we're aware of it? Mm -hmm. um, I don't. I certainly wouldn't want somebody submitting and uh, letting us accept a piece and then telling us very close to publication that. Um, it had already been accepted elsewhere, yeah. but I don't know. I, I think that's, I think it's pretty re reasonable. Um, mm -hmm. I would say asymptotes the same that they allow we allow multiple submissions, but request that if a piece is accepted somewhere else, to let the journal know right yeah. away. <clears throat> yeah, uh, same for us. Um, although I, I would also add that I'm sure none of the people in this room would have ever done such a thing. But three times in a single year, we accepted a piece. And then they, they notified the author and the author or, or the translator or author, I forget which. Um, they said, Oh, I was meaning to write, it was uh, just place. Oh. I'm going, Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so if, yeah. yeah, yeah, probably everyone does and needs to multiply submit, but keep track. <laughs> yeah. And let us know. Yeah. I've also, I mean, and also, we take simultaneous submissions, and that's because we take a really disgustingly long time sometimes to respond. But as I said, we're looking for translations, and my translation at my translation editor, Jesse Perry, is over there. <laughs> we want translations so much that we might actually encourage a translator to approach us directly through email instead of through online submissions, which is really weird. Um, but just for translations, since we're interested in them, we sometimes go, you know, cut corners. Um, if, if you are doing that and writing, for example, Jesse directly about something, I would say in that case, don't do a simultaneous submission, but if you're going yeah, through the yeah. on, or writing me directly, but if you're going through the online submission process, mm -hmm. then I would mm -hmm. definitely say that um, we welcome it because we take so long, we'd feel bad if we were holding you up. Yeah, I mean, slash moves at different speeds at different publications. I think yeah. it's always, I think simultaneous acknowledges that. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically all, all of our editors, except our managing editor, are volunteers, so, and everybody's overwhelmed. They have real jobs, uh, so, so we also take an absurdly long time sometimes. But we also do, um, we close down our submissions manager, um, but on, on the submissions guideline we say, except for translation, but yeah, obviously it's closed down, yeah. so, but you can send it to us directly. Yeah. How long do you take? Huh? Uh, we yeah, say we yeah, yeah we say, yeah we say three months and sometimes we've gone as long as as a year. And where's is Sergio in here somewhere? Yeah, I kind of lost track of one just recently. And yeah. you, you accepted so, you accepted mine I think in two weeks. Mm -hmm. And words without borders. It was um, I sent it one night and it was accepted the next day. Liz so just has a special power. Yeah. No, it's right. not. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's not that it's always slow. That's yeah. all. Yeah, and, yeah. And I think in general in translation we probably do better than They're three months. Fast. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, in the back over there. Um, yeah, this is a comment to anything. Possibly editors don't get enough pushback on that. I mean, I, I've heard a couple of apologies just now about absurdly long or terribly long, but um, I think there is I think there is a point for us writers and translators in which average too long is really too long. Um, and how do you feel about being recontacted, say, after six months? 
which yeah. is kind of my mental deadline. Oh, well, I'm cool with that. Because life, life is too short. <laughs> you know, a year is really long. Yeah. A year is really long. No, the year a, year is, a year is a mistake. So yeah. um, lost. And six months is absolutely you should contact yeah. us. Yeah. I think that's fine too. Okay. I'm happy with a query. It, yeah. Helps. Yeah. it helps. Yeah, I mean, I don't know exactly what we say on the website in terms of what to expect, but yeah, if it's, if it's been longer than that, I think it's acceptable to like politely call. Yeah. Just so don't swear at us. Yeah. I mean, and I, you know, I even feel like after six months, you could you could think you could move on if you wanted to, but sometimes people are really mad. Well, I'm glad the ban on simultaneous submissions is going away. Well, that was a real that was a real difficult. There, I mean, there's also you know you have to realize that when all the submissions went online, all of us got exponentially yeah. more submissions. Yes. So there's a lot of like, okay, so now we have five times the number of submissions that we had two years ago to read, and so we have to start accepting simultaneous submissions. So everything kind of shifts along yeah. with it, you know. Yeah. I mean, you complain try reading four thousand. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. A, a lot of magazines have will have uh, two thousand. You know, will get hundreds, especially again with with automated submissions in particular. People get publications get hundreds of submissions a day. And so if you think about, oh, you know, I just, you know, I slept an hour later today, so we're now, you know, the slush is now pushed back a month or so, you, you know, just <laughs> thinking, you know, I mean, when you think about the, you know, a lot, it's important to keep in mind that everybody's dealing a day, and it's an excellent point, man, about the, you know, just, you don't have to get an, amb a, you know, an envelope and a stamp the way you used to, yeah. so, and it's, you know, if it's free, submit, if people aren't charging, um, but it is something to keep in mind. Yeah, in the, in the back one. Right, thank you. Um, I know that many of the uh, many of you represent publications that work with minimal budgets, and you uh, you know you, a lot of your editorial staff will work uh, on a volunteer basis. Um, and so this is in, in case there are other aspiring uh, editors uh, in this room. Um, are there are those who is it is it possible to make your living as um, an editor for a literary magazine in this country? Um, where do you find your editors? Where can they, you know, where can they continue to build, your, build their careers? I thought you were gonna volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> we are looking. Yeah, we're looking for readers. Um, it's uh, the university jobs are nice. <laughs> <laughs> Except they're actually jobs. They're real jobs, yeah. Then you sh and the nice thing about the funny thing about universities is they think that um, editing a quarterly is the equivalent of teaching a class. Exactly. So, um, <laughs> really, is that it? A course yeah. release? One a course, course release, course. which it isn't. It you know it's no, so much more work. Yeah, it's 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 quite a bit more. But on the other hand, you have a house. You know, you have people who pay the bills for the printing and things like that. Yeah. So, yeah. that's a nice thing. At least from the for the university, yeah. I'd say that certainly um, depending on where on the publication for which you work, um, obviously some people are not paid at all, and other people are paid um, somewhat more than not at all. <laughs> um, I I do think it's I think it is something that an awful lot of people do, just like translation, work very hard for very little. And the rewards are not financial, um, but you still have to pay the bills. Mm -hmm. So, I remember Peter Bush telling me that he thought that there are about half a dozen, maybe eight people who make their living translating from Spanish into English, literary translators. And I think there are slightly more editors huh. yeah. that make their living from it, but basically the dynamic is pretty similar. Yeah, we're we're a press, so we also we do books plus the journal, so we actually have staff, but it's it's not a lot of staff. Like there's like, three of us, and none of us are full time. And we also have some volunteers that you know help with reading and like things here and there, and they're part of the editorial meetings. But yeah, but it's you know it's not like a lucrative profession. Everybody who works at Asymptote is a volunteer, including the person who runs it. So it's they, they, nobody gets any money at all. Does that answer your question? Basically, um, I, I come from this question. I, I think the word lucrative never really entered my head. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I come from I come from personally from a background of uh, editing and 
Brett's representation of lots and lots of translation. Um, and coming from foreign, having done that foreign country, coming back to the United States, and discovering that uh, publishing houses um, expected me to not talk about my foreign experience when looking for looking to start at the bottom. The U.S. publishing system is extremely high bound. Um, but I, I assume that a lot of editors, a lot of translators here, are also aspiring editors. We love to edit as much as we love to translate. And for many of us, it's sort of a, it's sort of a dream to finally to become employed doing doing editing. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think sometimes like it's not about necessarily your credentials or your skills. It's just kind of what's available. You, you know, it might be easier to get like an associate editor position than an editor position. Um, I mean, I myself, when I, when I first started publishing, I was uh, entering invoices into a computer uh, but at a very large distributor, and eventually I managed to get over where I was editing and writing the catalogs, but that was like about a year or so later. So, yeah, I mean, where you start isn't necessarily where you're going to be forever. It is, uh, I would say that publishing is a field that burn, that does expect an awful lot from, an, from a lot from a few. Um, we have, we're, we actually have three full-time employees, but we publish 12 issues a year. Um, and, you know, we're all run ragged, but you have no idea how nice it is to be here. No, but, but, um, <laughs> but I think it also depends on, a lot of it's luck. And I, you know, a lot of it is just ha you know, happy confluence. But if you put yourself in a position to, you know, receive it. Yes. Maybe we've got time for one more. If there's one more question, or are we questioned out? Yeah. If I can ask another one. Just a quick follow up on that. Um, could you talk a little bit about how your publications are funded? Especially the free ones. <laughs> <laughs> Asymptote has been looking at various sources of funding. I'm not sure that they have anything beyond a couple of small grants that they've gotten uh, recently, but. But their big issue was that everything came with strings attached. They, the Singapore government said they'd be happy to fund them if 30% if of the content was Singaporean in every issue. And they said, we don't want to limit ourselves that way. So, so that hasn't, uh, they, they haven't gone for government grants so far. And they're looking at various possibilities. It's also a bit of an issue. If you've got 80 people working on an issue, all of them volunteers, and then you go into uh, nonprofit status and you're paying people, you're suddenly just lurching into this enormous bureaucracy and, and all kinds of complications with paying people in different countries and so forth. And so so it's a new journal and I think they're a little bit anxious about how that will be but they do have an aspiration to become a nonprofit. That is something they're headed to. Yeah. Uh, we we are a nonprofit. Uh, we were started founded at the University of Massachusetts but but we're actually funded by the, it's called the five colleges, um, which includes Smith College, Amherst College, Hampshire College, and Mount Holyoke, along with the university. And they fund us to just over half of our budget, uh, and the rest comes from the usual suspects, permissions, uh, subscriptions. Um, and, uh, and since uh, I managed to, uh, to uh, a three-year campaign that was successful in getting my managing editor moved from part-time to full-time. Now we have time to apply for grants, and we just landed an NEA and a Dreyfus Congrats. Foundation grant. Yeah. Congrats. So. Um, we're entirely grant-supported. We're nonprofit. Um, the NEA is a huge funder of ours. We also depend very heavily on private foundations. Um, our executive director spends, an, I don't want to say the majority of her time, but a huge chunk writing grants and we're all we all in which we all participate um, and we d again we can be free online because we're nonprofit but we have a very vague institutional uh, affiliation with BARD in that wondrously we are BARD employees which means insurance oh, that's <laughs> yeah it's very very yes. nice yeah it's really it's really um, but that is, but Bar does not um, does not support us in, in any other way. They don't fund us. So, um, but yeah, we're very heavily, and you know, the uh, economic downturns really hit magazines. Um, you know, private private donors, um, mm -hmm. especially the ones who were with Madoff. Very unfortunate. 
We're totally funded by um, Fairleigh Dickinson University. They, they sort of, they're our publisher. And um, I've been fighting for six years to get my, my managing editor to more than halftime status. And one day we will. And that's. <laughs> Yeah, yeah we're, we're a nonprofit, so um, usual nonprofit subjects, uh, grants, donations, subscriptions, that sort of thing. Well, I know. <laughs> maybe, maybe it's time to wrap. Thank you so much for. Mm -hmm. all